if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 7 is where I'll take the text this morning. Um, Luke chapter 7, and we're going to begin reading in verse 36. Luke chapter 7, uh, beginning in verse 36. The, the Bible says, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat in meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And she stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. And when the Pharisees, which had bidden him, saw it, he, he, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known of what manner of woman this is, and that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed him 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me whether, tell me therefore which of them will love him the most. Simon answered and said, I suppose he that whom he forgave most. And he said, and he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water to wash my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. And this woman, since the time I came in, had not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore, I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom there little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for another opportunity to be back in your house, another opportunity to be with your people. God, this morning we pray that you would anoint your word with your power, with your glory, and that you would sear it into the hearts of the believers this morning. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, some very familiar verses of Scripture, and we're going to look at uh, really... Uh, <laughs> sitting at the feet of Jesus. Now, uh, I believe the very same woman, I believe this was Mary, the sister of Martha, and, uh, and, uh, and later she would sit at the feet of Jesus in a, in a different situation, and she would be criticized by her sister Martha for doing so. But the first thing I want you to understand this morning is this, is no time spent at the feet of Jesus is wasted. No time spent in the Word of God is wasted. Now, to really understand the text of what we're going to be preaching on this morning, you kind of have to understand the Jewish culture a little bit better than our own because uh, this is shoes to us. And they're nice and they keep our free feet warm and dry. And the... Uh, in, in the desert area that they live, very arid, dry environment, uh, they wore sandals most of the time, especially in that era, and uh, their feet got dirty very frequently. In addition to that, the Jewish law spoke about washing feet. Now, before I go further, I don't have an issue with a church, of churches that practice foot washing if they do it for the right reason. Most people with that now are old regular Baptists, and you don't see a lot. Some freewheelers will do it. And, but the, I think the point is this, is your area of humility, not 
whether you're going to actually do it or not. And again, I don't have an issue either way, but I will say this, most of us operate where the Pharisee operates. Uh, the point being is that we don't have the humility to do it and certainly don't have the humility to do it right. And that, and that was Mary's uh, issue. And we will find people who act truly in humility are often criticized by, other, by others just as Mary was. Now, going back to our text in the first verse, I want you to see that the real comparison here becomes between a religious person and a very sinful person. The religious person being the Pharisaical Jew and the very sinful person being this woman, if it was uh, 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 Mary and the, uh, Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, I'm not sure, I believe it is, but I want you to see very two different histories, very two, very dip, two different, very light, very different lifestyles, and they did things differently. Um, you know, people, people who are poor follow the Lord better. And uh, that's why the Lord Jesus told us possible to that hardly will a rich man enter into heaven. And the reason, it's not that they're rich, it's their pride. It's not even that they're trusting in their riches. It's their pride. They're too good for Jesus. They, they don't need his help. And when in reality, every one of us, you even think about the church at Laodicea in, in, in uh, Revelation chapter 7, they were the most wealthy group of all those seven churches and didn't know how spiritually poor they were. And, and so we find that that is definitely the situation here with this Pharisee and this woman. And, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. Now, on the, on the surface, it looks good. And uh, to some extent, this flesh being what it is, there's a cheap desire for Jesus. Now, we don't want to, we don't desire him uh, really to experience him. We want to desire him. We desire him to promote, promote self. Uh, that's what's wrong with Armenian doctrine. All it does is really promote you. It, it doesn't promote the work of Christ. It promotes you making a good decision. That's a pharisaical religion, and that's very much what he had. He wanted to look good to others, and he did have a little bit of interest in this person named Jesus. Let me say this. A little bit of interest in Jesus will not redeem your soul. It's impossible. And, and, and so we find that this, uh, that this uh, individual invites Jesus to his house. Notice in ver the rest of verse 36, and he went, meaning Christ, and went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. Now, I also want you to remember the differences between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. The Sadducees did not. In other words, the Pharisees believed that man was eternal, and the Sadducees did not. You know, I've often thought that was a very unusual belief system, to believe when this life is over, it's over. Uh, people do that so they can do what they want to do. They're accountable to nobody that way. They can, if this was it, hey, I can live it up. And so we find he goes into a man's house that believes there are eternal value, eternal soul within a man, and he goes to the house. Verse 37, And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner. Now, let me, let me say this. If you don't get anything else, you're a sinner. Let that one ring home to you. You're a sinner. Everybody under the sound of my voice is a sinner. I'm a saved sinner, but I'm a sinner, and I'm still very, very good at it, right? And if you're not a saved sinner, you're just a plain sinner, and you're in desperate need of Christ. Yeah. That, 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 that's your only two possible situations this morning. And so this woman who was a sinner, every one of us can identify with her, every one of us can under, uh, uh, understand her position. Now, Jews being what Jews were, they wanted to gradiate, and there's some sins worse than others. But you know, this is what uh, the Lord Jesus says, that's not true. 
Sins are equal. Sins are the same. We can't gradiate them. We can't say, oh, she's worse than he is. He's drank six beers and he's only ate two. He's only drank two, so he's worse. No, no. You know, those ideas come from man. They do not come from God. And so we find that the, the man that owns the house thinks he's better than the woman. You think you're better than somebody else? I think every one of us get that way at times, don't you? We're not. We're all sinners. We're all in desperate need of Jesus Christ. And, and we certainly never need to get prideful the way this man did. Verse 37, And behold, a woman in the city which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at me in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Now, this ointment was costly. This is the same box of ointment that uh, Judas would say should have been sold and given to the poor. Very costly item. Very expensive. It, it, it's like drugs here in 2022. Uh, even with insurance, me and Donna probably pay $200 a month in, in, in medications alone. And, and that's with decent health insurance. I can imagine without it. And, 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 and so... Uh, I've heard it say, and I don't know what the uh, two, 2022 rendering would be, but when I was young in the ministry, somebody said this was about $300 worth of ointment in the 90s. That's a lot of money. Uh, especially when you make very, very little money to start with. So when she, she, buy, she brings the thing that's most valuable to her. Do you, you know what you need to bring to the feet of Jesus? Because that's what she's fixing to do is be down at the feet of Jesus. You know what you need to bring to the feet of Jesus? The very best that you have. That's what you need to bring. If you can sing, if you can write, if you can just say amen, bring the very best to the feet of Jesus. We waste it on the world way, way too much, do we not? We give 110% to the workplace, and we give 5% to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not pleased with that. And so we see that this sinful woman brings something more mighty than the rich Pharisee. In addition to what, he, what they actually offer, she shows more compassion. How much compassion do you show in a day's time? How much interest do you, do you show in the people of God? How much interest do you show in His book? We are, we are to be captivated by this. And so she brings something very costly to the feet of Jesus. Verse 38, And stood at His feet. Now, she's fixing to uh, get in a situation really to serve the Lord. And I'm not exactly sure how this exactly transpired because their eating was very different than ours. Uh, they didn't have uh, chairs to sit in and the table was up here and we, we dig in like we do downstairs. It was more of eating. Um, uh, I understand that probably they sat on pillows and stuff. They may not have even had uh, a table like we think of it. But I want you to see, she, she's first standing at the feet of Jesus. Now, that is significant because you know what? Feet stink. They're a very dirty part of the body. And we have nice shoes again here in the modern day, but you know, at the end of the day, when you take your shoes off, you got the same situation as they did way back then, right? I'm too good to stand there. I don't like the odor. Now, you know what? All things in serving Christ is not going to be pleasant. All things in serving Christ is not going to smell good. See what I'm saying? All things are not going to be palatable. Some things we just have to do. And so we find her first not, not sitting at the feet of Jesus, but standing. You know, kind of maybe getting up, getting up the courage. Get Building oneself up. You know, uh, when you're learning to ride a bike, you fall off several times, do you not? When you're, when you're serving the Lord Jesus Christ, getting in the right spot is crucial. 
And with understanding at the feet of Jesus, prepared to do what uh, what the Lord had sent her to do. And again, we'll find in a minute, it's a very Jewish thing to do. Um, verse 38, and she stood at the feet, and she stood at his feet, and big behind him weeping. Now, to accomplish this task, she needed some water. Uh, she needed some moisture. Now, what do you think made her cry? I think she was sorry over her sin. I really do. A person who's grieved over their sin will cry. That's why sometimes when I, I you know, I wonder at people if they've really been redeemed when they're not even sorry of their sin to start with. Uh, they, uh, the, the weeping was something that she was going to have. Now, with, with this weeping and this grief over sin that, that supplies her with one of the things she, need, she needs, let me point out this, who was not weeping? And that was the Pharisee. He was not weeping. He was not grieved over his sin. You know what? He deserved that Jesus be there. <laughs> Listen, we, we don't deserve anything from Christ. You know what we deserve? We, need to, we deserve to be hellbound, throw the light off in the pit, and because it's goodness and grace and mercy is the only reason we're not. And see, we find this ignorant woman who many suggest was a prostitute knew more about spiritual things than a trained Pharisee. You know what? I think we've arrived there sometime as Baptist people that, that people who truly understand repentance better than we do. And that was the condition of this woman. See, repentance will drive you to do things for God. Every time. True repentance will drive you uh, to service. And, and, and so we find, uh, we find that she is crying so much that she can wash his feet. And began to wash his feet with tears. So much, so much tears, so much supply of moisture she's able to do this and did wipe them with the hairs of her head. Now, that, that, that's some long hair, and that is getting the job done, that she's able to cry and, and, and get some hair and, and get it moistened, and then put on the feet of Jesus and begin to rub his feet and, and, and wash with her tears. That's a remarkable thing. See, uh, everybody wants the, you know, uh, concerning a, wo uh, a woman's length of hair. We want to just throw that out the window and say that's old-fashioned. No, you know what? This woman, whatever her lifestyle may, Mary was prepared years ago. Listen, you don't get hair down to here in three days, right? That's years. That, that's years of preparation. You know what? You may have a possession or an ability right now that God's going to use 10 years from now. Keep it going. Be prepared. It may not be tomorrow. You know, again, I don't know how old uh, Mary was at this time, but uh, she was at least an, an adult individual, and, and she had been prepared. She had this hair for the Lord's service, so she had the hair... And she had the tears, she had the water, she was grieved over her sin, and she put it to use. What have we put to use? What is your ability? I think that's a very important question. Uh, you know, people, the Lord don't save people just to sit. And, you know, over the years, and, and praise God for people who have that ability, I can't write. I can't write well. And that's okay. And Jared can. Um... Use what you have. And don't focus on what you don't have. I've acknowledged I can't write. I can preach a little. Let me use what I do have, right? I think we focus on what we can't do more than what we can do, don't you? So use what you have. And so we find that this woman was well equipped for what we will find a very sedimentary job. You know what? Your job with Christ may be very routine 
and sedimentary, something that you think is not worthwhile, something that you don't think is important, but I want you to see that it is important in God's eyes. So he wash, she washes his feet, and notice what she does, and kissed his feet. That takes a lot of compassion, doesn't it? It takes a lot of compassion. You ever kiss something that you didn't want to? No. And probably more so for me, but when mother died, and, uh, I went on down to Erin, they called Donna, and she had passed away, and I wasn't even at the end of Bump Smith Road. So the time I got down to Erin, Mom was cold. And I kissed her on the forehead, and I don't know if it was for me or for her, <laughs> probably for me. And it was cool. It was very cool to my, my mouth. And uh, can, you, can you imagine loving someone enough that you kiss their feet and mean it? I mean, mean it in a compassionate way, motivated by love. That's what Mary had that the Pharisee didn't. A love for Christ that extended far past the routine. You know what? That's what we need in the modern day is a love for Christ that excels the routine. That will be sustaining in the day which we live. Verse 39. Now when the Pharisee, now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, meaning this display of love, he spake within himself saying, this man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Now, I want you to see that the Pharisaical man put full judgment on that young woman. We, we, we make assumptions by what we see, do we not? Now, we live in a very, very strange day. And I told you, I mentioned this before since I've been working in Paris the last six, eight months. Uh, I've got to know the place a lot better than I really ever have. And you would not believe the amount of homeless people in Paris, Tennessee. I see more homeless people over there than I do in Clarksville. Now, I'm sure there's probably more in Clarksville because I don't necessarily know where to look. But I go by and they're pushing their Walmart buggies and it has things hanging off of it. And, their clothes are all messed up, and immediately assumptions come to my mind. I bet he's on dope. I, mean, every, I bet he's never worked a day in his life. Do I, do I know that? No. I'm making assumptions, right? I'm presuming things that I really know nothing about. Some of them, you know what, probably I'm dead on. <coughs> Others, maybe not. Others, uh, may be mentally ill, never had the capacity to work, not, not, not taking their meds, and so they, they go off on a binge, and, and they're never found again. See, we, we assume so much. But let me, let me remind you this, but for the goodness of God, there go I. And, and so we see that this Pharisee, very prideful in himself, very glad in himself, does the thing what many of us would do without the goodness of God, and I, and I believe we're more compassionate people than many, <laughs> says he can't even pick up on what this woman's about. Verse 40. And Jesus answering and said to him, Simon, I have one somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. Now what he thought was coming was a compliment. What the pharisaical individual thought, oh yeah, here he comes. Simon, what is, Larry, I have somewhat to say unto you. Now knowing myself, and at least being able to acknowledge it, and to me saying, say on Lord, it probably, I might have to probably start mine somewhere where I'm sorry. Because I know what I'm about, right? But, he was excited. See, that showed his depth of spirituality, didn't it? Uh, I know I'm better than she is. Uh, 
we we uh, we we need to be like the sinner woman. We need to be like there is no job too low or too miry or too dirty for me. We need to be like her. Verse forty one tells him this tells him this parable. There was a certain man. I mean, excuse me. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And if you do that in our modern, a pence is a tenth of a penny. So you can see that both these sums are very, very small. Uh, uh, Jarrett can figure it out for us later, but I think it would end up being like $5 uh, or $50 and $5, something like that. And uh, so very relatively small amount of money. And they say, uh, and when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me there for which of them loved him most. And because he says the one that got, got the most forgiven. Now, you think about in your own life, and you review honestly within yourself, how much has he forgiven you? How much has he done for you? How much has he accomplished for you? And your end result would have to be everything. That, that's the only statement you could come up with. Now, I feel like and I believe that that old Pharisee thought he was the one that 50 pence was forgiven. But you know what? I bet in the reality, he was the 500. See, pride is something that will take us down, will it not? So we find what we need to be is, you know what will be your best drive to service? Remember what he did for you. Your best push to the gospel ministry is thinking that he died. If you would have been the only elect, he would have done it just for you. Because that's who he is. And so that kind of compassion, that kind of individualized care Will, will drive us to the point where we need to be, where we can have compassion that goes far beyond what this world has to offer. Verse 43, uh, Simon answered and said, I suppose he to whom he forgave the most. And he, meaning Christ, said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. I, I think that is very interesting that it, that it, it is recorded that way. So say that, uh, that uh, Bella is the woman and Simon is over here. Say Simon is Jared. He turns to the woman, but he's talking to Jared. The focus was the forgiveness. The message was for the sinner. That message is for us. We need to be very, very conscious of what the Lord has done for you. You ever get sick of it? I mean, when I say sick of it, the world, everything that's happening around us, just um, don't feel like continuing sometimes. Don't, don't feel like moving forward. Well, remember, remember this. Remember what he paid it all, so what could you possibly hold back? To the very last breath that he's given you, praise the name yeah. of Jesus. Yeah. And it gets hard. The, the older I get, the more hard it is to travel. But God being my helper, I'm going to still travel. If I get invited to, to speak of the goodness of the Lord, I'll go until I can't go no more. And then when I can't go no more, would to God that I would pray for those who do that's where we as the Lord's people need to be. We need to be a prayerful people. We need to be like Mary. And nothing, no, nothing, is, nothing is too difficult for us to do. Then he says, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thy house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet. Now, why, why is this significant? Why, why did the Lord point this out? Well, first of all, this Pharisee who thought he was so great and wonderful with the Jewish law 
That's what he was supposed to do. Not only didn't he didn't wash them, he didn't even have things ready for the washing to be done. You, you remember at the, uh, at the wedding of Cana of Galilee? And the Lord made wine out of two firkins, uh, those barrels that had two firkins in it, and what the purpose was, that was a hand-washing bucket. And there was also supposed to be a feet-washing bucket. And when you came in, you cleaned your feet. If you were going into a house, and America is about the only nation that doesn't do this, if you go into another culture's house, you take your feet off, you take your shoes off at the door. Uh, if you ever visited Brother Downs and, and, and Nancy, when they were still living here, she insisted that you take her your shoes off when you entered in her, her house. Do you know why? It's a sign of respect. And this washing of the feet was just the same thing. It showed respect to the person that you had invited. Remember when the, the Godhead uh, visited Lot? What happened? He washed their feet, remember? Brought them in, washed their feet, and fed them. It was a Jewish cultural thing. So inviting this man into his house and thinking he was so righteous and so good as a Jewish person, he didn't even follow the first Jewish law in courtesy. Do you ever think about, do you do that? Do, do you invite the Lord Jesus into your home respectively and courteously and, and, and appreciate the times he does show up? That's what we should do. That's what we should do as the Lord's people. And, and so the Lord Jesus points out, said, you didn't even do that part. Compares him to the sinner. But she have washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time uh, I came in, have not ceased to kiss my feet. Now, also in the Jewish culture, and if you watch much TV, uh, uh, the only one I really know about this, but some of you will remember it, on the, uh, the Ingalls family, uh, with the Little House on the Prairie, the series that Michael Landon did, Nellie Olson marries a Jew. Y'all remember that? Uh, Percival. And when Percival's father comes for the birth of the first child, he walks up to Mrs. Olson and goes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, once on each cheek. And why did he do that? And she, you can imagine her reaction. It's because he was Jewish. He was doing the biggest courtesy he could show her. And that's how they greeted each other. You know, the Bible says, uh, Greet the, greet the brethren with a kiss. Ever been to a Mennonite church? They'll do it. But the Bible also says, <laughs> offer them the right hand of fellowship, so we'll go with that, right? But she was Jewish. I mean, he was Jewish. He knew why to do it. And he chose not to honor the Lord. We need to choose to honor him every opportunity we can, can we not? You think about all that he's done for us. Can we, can we not choose to lift him up? To say he is able, he is the one, he is the glorified, he's the very living son of God. That's what we are to do. And so he points out, the Lord Jesus points out that this Jewish man, this Pharisee, had not, do, had not done it. My head with oil, thou didst not anoint now, again, this was a Jewish courtesy, uh, and it was to, and, and, it, and I'm not sure any of y'all have ever been into a Mennonite or an Amish, an old Amish house recently, but Donna uh, will tell you this, when you go in the kitchen door, the back door, immediately to the left, there's always a sink there. It looks like a bathroom sink. And the men come in, they wash their hands, they wash their beard, they will come through their hair, and then they go into the rest of the house. It, it is their custom. It's what they do. Now, years ago, uh, Sister Diane gave me and Donna a washstand that was her father's from the, from the Pace house. And we still have it today. That's what it was back in the, when the English people still did that. It was set at the back, and when you came in, you cleaned up. Well, this was, this was just the very same process after you cleaned up, you know, you put something in their hair. 
keep their scalp healthy, keep their hair healthy. It was courtesy. It was a sign of respect. And this man didn't even give it, didn't even offer him anything. One thing not to do it on his behalf and put his hair together for him, he didn't offer him the supplies to do it. What have you offered Christ today? What, 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 have, you, what have you put toward him? What, what have you made available in and of yourself to Christ? That's what we're to do. And so we find the Lord Jesus not to be critical, but he pointed out all the abnormalities of the service of the Jew that thought he was doing so well. And it should be our strive to serve Jesus with everything we possibly can have. Verse 47, wherefore, because of all these things, the way that you've neglected me, the way that you've treated me, wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. So it gets down to this. We'll be real honest. He's forgiven us all much. So much. Everything that we possibly could come into our mind, the filthiness of this mind, the filthiness of this flesh, he's forgiven it all. So what's not, what would not be available to him from us? You gonna save a dollar? God help us. You gonna save 10 minutes? Well, I wait a little bit longer, I won't have to be at church as quick. God help us, this is our sanctuary. This is where we belong. It's not a chore. <laughs> it's, it's something to enjoy. It's an opportunity. It's a blessing. Yeah. And so we, as the Lord's people, if you really want to serve Him, and that, that, that is your own answer to make, if you really want to serve Him, serve Him like a woman that was forgiven much. Don't put anything aside. Don't hold anything back. But give it your all, because you know what? At the end of the day, he gave his all for you. Everything he could pour out. The last amount of blood was gone, and the last suffering, and he cried, it is finished. You know, when you know when the Lord, you know when the Lord said that, it wasn't that his life was finished. No. It was that the atonement was complete. Yeah. That's what was finished. Right. He did that for us. What would you withhold from him? Nothing possible, is it?